And I think shamanism, again, is, is gifted with some tools to discovery of that purpose. And earlier you were talking about the vision quest and maybe we can go into it again. And yeah, if you, because I know you were part of a big ceremony, which I think is very important where 350 men in Belgium underwent a collective vision. Yes, in a way that that's true, even though the, the project itself was limited to 15 young men and their either biological father or adoptive father or a, or a mentor, but it was set up in such a way that those 15 men were sent off by the whole group before they went into their vision quest. And the vision quest was partly, certainly for the younger ones, intended as a sort of rite of passage into the full potential of manhood. And just briefly, historically, in, in the U.S., Robert Bly was the first one in a big way who, through his workshops and also through his books, you know, the most important one of which was Iron John. And also maybe another figure whom you probably know is Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you're the hero's journey. Absolutely. Yeah. And th those interviews that I forget his name did with him just before he passed away, actually, and they were broadcast on, on PBS. They had a major, major influence culturally because Campbell was able to bring these different myths of all these cultures worldwide together and show that there was a certain pattern to it. And one of those patterns is the hero's journey where you, you get lost in the woods and all that, but you have to go on into the adventure and you have to meet your demons. And then eventually you, you return and then you return as somebody with wisdom to share. And if you don't share your wisdom, the, the journey is not completed, you know? And so in that sense, your reference to non-duality and then what? You cannot bypass the, the journey. Otherwise, it's not really authentic. You're just, yeah, you, I don't know. And, and I don't want to be too critical either because everybody somehow is on the path. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the purpose is not to be, not to be critical, to not be dismissive at the same time. I think that has to be highlighted because I feel like often, at least in, in that case, the absolute realization is used to dismiss the relative. And I think that that becomes exactly the word that you used, a bypass. And I was going to check in with you about this with you later, but I, I want to see now, because it, it seems relevant, that somehow it's paradoxical, right? That the great spirit, there is unity. And yet maybe need is not the right word, but there is an expression of that one right into the into the many forms and this creation and i think that is sacred and that's what perhaps shamanism would say and other than th there is no need to dismiss that because as a matter of fact it seems like the more we understand the absolute we can body more and more and know what is the right way or the most informed way to live our life in duality so it, it's, a, it's a package deal, right? Paradoxically, it's not one does not negate the other. And the, and the mind wants to do that. The mind wants to categorize and say, okay, this is good and this is bad. And so I, I'm finding in my path diminishment of the need to resolve this paradox. I feel like you have to live the paradox and not, it's not this way or that way. Yeah, I, I would agree with that very much so. And certainly it connects with shamanism in a certain way and, and also with Sufism specifically that there is a path and even knowing that there is a path is already certainly a, 
a big start of awakening, knowing that. And that's where the vision quest comes in. It, it is a sort of a very explicit container to allow people the experience that something about that path, their specific path, will be revealed during the vision quest. And in my limited experience of that, almost everyone who takes that particular path in terms of vision question, they come out and are changed. The, the, the young man that I saw at the festival coming out on the last day after their last suf suffering, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to exaggerate it, a sleepless night in the woods and they were, they were protected and supported and all that and honored. But then then in the sweat lodge, the final sweat lodge, sitting with 50 men, including their father, who at the end of the lodge washes them respectfully. I mean, what a tender thing for two males to do, especially father, son. So the healing that happens at that moment, not just for those sons and fathers, but for the other people in the lodge. And then when they come out and there is 200 men standing there, honoring them, respecting them, kneeling for them to give them a, a sense of dignity. And of course, you know, these young men, obviously they are a bit shy or in error. They don't want to stand there. And then there is another part which has been healed of a trauma they were not even aware of, not just their own trauma, but the trauma of the previous generations. I mean, how many of us can say that we were fully bond bonded with our father or, or mother for that matter, matter? I mean, almost nobody, right? Even in enlightened households, there is still very often a major disconnect between the generations. And sometimes there is a grandfather or grandmother that takes that function of being an elder, a wise elder. But most, most men, and actually I, I have to say also most women, have not been initiated in a proper way. And that's why we see these, these gang stuff and drug, and a lot of drugs, of course. There is a, a deep, deep longing to have an ecstatic experience of oneness, which some people do have with drugs. So I'm, I'm not totally putting that aside as a possible path. But of course, if it's an addiction, then it's no longer a path. And if, if, if it's not done in a sacred way, there is also yet another calamity in society, right? And, and I include, in a way, ayahuasca in that. I think ayahuasca has a great potential and for some people can provide a sudden insight in their purpose here. I mean, that happens to a fair amount of people. Depends a bit on the, the leader and, and the situation and all that. But then to make it into a new addiction, which, which happens for some people, is, is again, you know, oh no, oh no. Oh, no. I mean, we, we did that with LSD, right, in the 60s, which really was a big, big opening. But then also there were so many casualties. And then it was put into the, into the whole prison system. So that's crazy, right? Then you were put in prison for, for having taken LSD or something. I mean, so the culture is still, I think, in technical terms, extremely neurotic. Right, it's a it's a case of neurosis, widespread neurosis, and so that's mm -hmm. yeah. So so that that's the dark side, but on the on the, the the paradox is the one where we see that trauma, if it happened, contains potentially a huge gift for the rest of your life, if and when it is being healed. If it is being bypassed, 
then no matter which path you're taking, it's not going to deliver the goods of deep satisfaction and happiness and meaning of your life. Once you see that your suffering actually had, had some meaningful aspect to it, that you can guide other people because of your suffering, you have a deeper knowing, you have a deeper empathy and, and no, this is not the right path. We, one should not inflict, inflict misery on other people. That's not what humanity should be about. So, so the more people have that as a deep insight, the better chances of having a better society. And I think maybe that's where I wanted to go a bit. If spirituality is devoid of some sort of social activism, it limits the interest of such a path because one does not exclude the other. It does not. That's just another dichotomy. Mm -hmm.